we'll be talking about um, uh, a topic which uh, is uh, um, not one that we in the Federal Trust always talk about, which but which is obviously very central to our work, uh, which is um, the governance of the United Kingdom. Um, those of you who followed the Federal Trust over in recent years will know that Federal Trust works very closely with the Global Policy Institute, uh, a think tank, um, which usually, once again, concentrates uh, on international issues, but on, on this occasion is doing a project um, which has the title, which is the title of our webinar, Regionalizing um, uh, Democracy in the United Kingdom. And the two leading members of this project are, are Dr. Andrew Black and Professor Sam Winster. Good evening to both of them and thank them very much for joining us. We're going to have a, an introduction to the project, which I think some of you have read something about on the website uh, from Andrew and Sam. And then we're very lucky to have uh, as a, a commentator, if you will, uh, Councillor Simon Hennig, uh, who's going to talk about um, what Andrew and Sam have had to say and put that in the context perhaps of the Gordon Brown Commission on, on the governance and on the future of the United Kingdom. Um, and then in, in as, as the final speaker, we're very lucky to have uh, Francis Foley from the uh, think tank Compass, who will be putting this in a, a, an international context, uh, which is particularly appropriate for the, the federal trust with his interesting interest in federalism, and particularly perhaps um, uh, German federalism in Europe. So uh, we're going to start with um, Andrew Black, um, who's going to be introducing um, the project. He's the Managing Director of Digital Limited, which is a financial consultancy firm. He's a Senior Research Fellow at um, Brunel Business School and a Senior Research Fellow at the Global Policy Institute. He's worked in and lived in Germany for many years, so um, he'll be a, a particularly interested listener to what um, Francis has to say later on. But, but Andrew, at the moment, the floor is yours, and we're going to be talking uh, about um, democratic regionalism within the United Kingdom. Well, thank you, Brandon, and thank you to our other speakers. Uh, and uh, to say that uh, I've had a look at some of the work that they've done, and I must admit I'm most impressed, and also to say hello to all the, the people watching. Uh, this is a fairly arcane uh, subject in some respects, and it's probably not going to uh, pack in thousands and thousands of people, although we'd obviously like to be that way. But I think what one also should say, though, is that the topic itself is actually very, very important. And as Sam and I have been working on it, so we've been unfolding various aspects of it. So I have about 10 minutes to talk. And I think what I'll try and do is pick up a few points, salient points, I think, both about the existing system and about some of the proposals that we have for how we might change that. And finally, come to uh, give you a couple of concrete examples, if you like, of um, how and what sort of differences could unfold as a result of putting some of these kinds of changes in place. So I don't know if any of you saw the Andrew Neal program yesterday, but it was very fertile stuff as far as I was concerned. I saw it almost by accident, since it raised an interesting topic called decentralization. And decentralization, according to George Osborne or Ed Balls, um, uh, as two of the people there, uh, was never really very well defined. But it seems that there seems there seems to be a sort of general feeling amongst the establishment, if you want to call them that, that all is not well with governance in Great Britain. And again, let me just sort of pick up a couple of points there. One of the ones that was interesting was about HS2, the railway project, which is, as you know, not even getting as far as West London or further than West London at one point until Jeremy Hunt came out and said very smartly, no, no, it would go to Euston after all. Um, the point is that this project started back in the years of Thatcher. Cecil Parkinson was the person who was apparently the first one to sort of dream up this wonderful idea. And here we are something like 40 years later, and it's still not complete. And one of the reasons that was given for this is the constant switch of policies in the vertical center of government, as the center could not make up its mind which way this line should go, how long it should be, how many trains it should have, and so on and so on and so on. And as you know, it's gradually been pared down and pared down. One of the things which has been largely missing from that sort of debate has been an input from the regions. And I'll come back to that in a moment. In the House of Lords itself, all is well is all is also not well. 
It's a revising chamber, which they take some pride about. But it's also a scene of open corruption, as we discovered just recently with Lady Moan, I think her name was, who managed to use a VIP channel and her status as somebody as a sitting peer in the House of Lords to win various PPE projects or um, and contracts uh, to the tune of £300 million. And although we have a recent problem with somebody's tax affairs um, of a mere five million, uh, the company that she was involved with managed to produce profits of 29 million pounds, 29 million pounds, which was promptly salted away in a foreign tax haven. Now, I don't suspect, I suspect that she's by no means the only person who profited from such things. But it's indicative, if you like, of a cosy establishment arrangement, which is actually uh, rather dysfunctional in many, many respects. But if we think a bit more about reforming the House of Lords, which is, I think, where we started, Sam and I, one of the major things that became fairly obvious to us very, very quickly is that there was actually nowhere in the British Constitution where you could honestly say that uh, there's a place for the regions as regions and devolved nations to sit down and talk together about issues which affect the regions. And th that is the, the, the thing that the aspect, if you like, which the, ha needs to be both uh, articulated and for which powers need to be given. There have been various efforts to reform the House of Lords in the past, but for reasons I don't quite understand, perhaps I haven't read enough, the actual decision or the ability to put regions uh, onto the top agenda, or indeed to transform the House of Lords into uh, an upper house of the regions and the devolved territories or devolved nations, is something which appears to us to be relatively novel and new. And as you pose that sort of, or put it that way, uh, one of the institutions and organizations which we started to look at, and uh, again from our experience, was actually from Germany, and this is the Bundesrat. The Bundesrat is the upper house in Germany, and it represents the regions, and the regions in Germany are called Länder, and there are 16 of them, and they all have a, vo a vote on the upper house um, in Germany on matters which affect the regions. And in Germany, 60% of the legislation, which is coming through from the Bundestag, which is the equivalent to the House of Commons, is reckoned to also have impacts on the regions. And therefore, the regions and the Bundesrat are entitled to have a view on it. And on occasions, their views may even override the House of Commons. And if there is serious disagreement between them, there is something called the Vermittlungsausschuss, which is a um, committee where the two sides have to come together and find some kind of a compromise. There are circumstances, I believe, where the the um, the, uh, the, the, Bund the, the Bundesrat can effectively slow down or even prevent certain things happening in government uh, in so far as they represent the regions. And we posit that as a kind of horizontal layer of government, if you like, of decisions which affect the regions and which allow the regions to interact with each other and form either blocks or joint interest groups and of, of things of that nature. But we can take it even one step further than that, because one of the other issues which has come up is the question of the devolved nations. And the devolved nations have been devolved but set up largely by the central governments in Westminster in different ways. It seems rather unbelievable that there are three devolved nations and they all have three different electoral systems work in them, mostly purport all proportional representation, but not necessarily the same system. They also have different levels of uh, competence in certain areas, and there's not been any great effort made to kind of standardize that. And uh, one of our proposals is to find a way of incorporating the interests of the devolved nations into a formal representation in a house of uh, the upper house of the regions and devolved nations, so that they too can be put into a, a forum where issues affecting them as a region is uh, something which can be debated and discussed. And I think given the political issues around uh, devolution at the moment, 
it might be uh, one point to, to, to consider, which is this. Some people have asked us, why would anyone want to go down this road, apart from the fact that the governance of Britain is suffering badly because of various forms of incompetence? I think one could turn that around and say that if the United Kingdom has a formal political unit is to continue in existence, then given the promises made in 2014 after the Scottish independence referendum, that there would be further concessions made to the regions by the central government in Whitehall, which was frankly completely overruled and overridden by the results of the 2016 Brexit referendum, which if you recall, Scotland voted against, Northern Ireland voted against, they wanted to stay in the Union, uh, in, in the European Union, and it was only Wales that perhaps uh, was slightly more ambiguous. So thereby sort of effectively throwing into a waste paper basket any promises that have been made by the party leaders in the House of Commons in 2014. So it seems to us that one of the important questions is, um, if you're going to have a, a reform of the House of Commons to, in, sorry, House of Lords, in order to take into account regional interests more seriously, then one's also got to think in terms of what regions should we have in England? Because one, the main reforming point here would be to suggest that there could be reforms in England that would create something equivalent perhaps to the lender in Germany, but not necessarily only that, because there are other federal systems as well that you could look at, where the powers uh, that were um, in a sense given to the regions and given to, given, given to them would be quite considerable and certainly on a par with those in the devolved nations and possibly in some cases even more so. What we would see as being a possibility is that the regions could then start to take a much more serious and committed view about their own medium and long-term development, and particularly when it comes to things like infrastructure investment, which currently they cannot do because they're often being overridden by the situation in Whitehall and in London. Or I think, as Frances says in one of her, in, in the very interesting report she wrote, uh, I think it's sort of how to manage the deficit through regional policy. I think it's the rough equivalent. Uh, that was, was was mentioned, where there's a lot of trimming which goes on if they don't have enough money in Whitehall, and it's the regions that generally tend to fall off the perch first. So this is the sort of core of our uh, thinking at the moment about how to both save the union and to recreate the um, the, the house of the upper house of, of the regions and devolved uh, ter uh, devolved nations. Now I don't know how much time I've got, but probably not much. Well, so, precisely none. But if you want to have a couple more sentences, could I, go ahead. Could I just then mention one of one other area as an example of the knock-on effects of the way in which these reforms could work in other areas? Consider for the moment the banking system of Great Britain. There are five clearing banks, which basically account for about 95% of the lending to all small and medium sized enterprises. If you look at Germany, the lender all have their own system of government or state and collectively owned uh, banks. They're called Sparkassen, savings banks, and they carbonate in a thing called a Lunders bank. The interesting thing about that is when you look at it, is that something like 50%, it's the biggest single block of lending uh, to SMEs comes through these Sparkassen, which are all established by the lender in Germany. And if you look at the, the, the amount of prayer private savings these banks have, they account for just about, first, I think the biggest chunk again, 45% or something like that of, of uh, the savings accounted for in, in Germany. And this is because this is a local organization or they are local organizations, they're owned locally and they operate locally. And this would have a dramatic, I think, uh, transformational effect on the way in which, uh, for example, SMEs are treated in the regions, which, as far as we know, is not at all good, and economic performance tends to bear that out. So, very quickly, uh, I'm sorry I have to stop so, so fast, but this is just to give you a taste of some of the direct and indirect effects which could come about by adopting some kind of reform of the sort that we're proposing in our document.
So I better hand over to Sam. Very good indeed. Point. Thanks very much. Just one question about the last issue you raised, that of the Sparkassen. Mm. Um, critics sometimes say that uh, the Sparkassen um, become easy prey for local politicians, that there's just as much or a comparable amount of corruption <laughs> and clientelism that goes on at the local level as you've complained about in the House of Lords. What would you say to that? Um, well, immediately I would have to say pass because I haven't looked at that in any great detail. But I can see the point. I can see that there, there certainly that is something which is certainly a, a possibility. But I think the Germans on the whole have fairly strict systems to make sure that sort of thing doesn't happen, which fail occasionally. It would have to be looked at. I, I, I doubt, no doubt about it. And uh, especially given the, 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 the current culture, if you like, of uh, the corruption that we've seen in this country and the Conservative Party and governments and so on, it would have to be looked at and watched. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for that introduction. I, I should have mentioned that if you have questions or comments to make, use either the Q&A button or the chat button, um, and we'll have plenty of opportunity for discussion later on. Uh, the second half of the introduction is going to be offered by Professor Sam Winster, who's a Deputy Director of the Global Policy Institute and a member of the Academy of Social Sciences. He's the editor of um, the international journal Max Weber Studies, uh, he's written a lot on Max Weber, and I've made my modest contribution to his articles by translating some of the Latin tags, which Weber uses so often. Um, thank you um, to my co-author, Sam, for coming to uh, join us today. Um, would you like to follow on from what uh, Andrew's been telling us? Yes, th thank you, Brendan. Uh, I'm uh, very much the uh, draftsman uh, at this point, and I'm going to make seven points. Um, the simplest That'll way. Be one to... and a half minutes for each point, Sam. Average down. The simplest way to rectify the hegemony of the unitary vertical state is to reform the House of Lords into an upper house of the devolved nations and the English regions. This proposal gives a reformed upper house clear powers and functions, which to date have been mostly absent. That is, in the debate on the elected House of Lords. It is not sufficient to democratize the House of Lords, but to give a duly constituted upper house explicit competencies and legislative powers, as well as an electoral franchise consistent with its redefined purpose. So, you know, you're arguing democratizing the House of Lords, but you're regionalizing democracy, think of them as building two spans of a bridge, you've got to meet them in the middle, and that's the design. You've got to somehow interlink them. Now, as Andrew said, there's an urgency of an urgency about reform. The rise of nationalist movements, nationalist movements, slightly different from self-determination, and political parties in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland threatens the integrity of the United Kingdom. If the UK is to hold together and retain its status as a major international power, then it will be necessary to provide the devolved nations with strong legal assurances and guarantees that their interests can be genuinely debated. The English regions are demanding quite justifiably parity with the devolved nations. An upper house should be the ultimate arbiter of inter-regional, that is to say the horizontal level, and able to define its competences and functions in relation to the House of Commons. Right, now this is very good, it's interesting, power. The upper house would have the final and legally binding word on defined areas of government policy that directly affect the regions and devolved nations. It is also envisaged that there could be specific circumstances where a majority in the upper house would have the legislative power to overrule the House of Commons, unless there was an overriding two thirds majority in the House of Commons. Right, my fourth point. On the other hand, on the one hand, sorry, there is an offer to the devolved nations and regions that they have real influence at the center of the vertical state. On the other, conflict that produces a stalemate between the two chambers needs to be avoided. 
The aim is to rework the existing advisory role of the House of Lords. Instead of the House of Lords intervening after a bill has gone through the Commons, the new chamber advises and negotiates before a bill goes to the Commons. Um, and if you think about the architecture of the palaces of Westminster, that was how it was designed by Charles Barry. So the, you can walk up and down. And of course, it was 1852 when it was opened. And the Lords had a degree of parity with the, with the Commons. So it was a bit more even Stephen, whereas the Lords, as a trophy in terms of its power, and everybody says it's there to advise whether that's a defence or not, I don't know. Um, I think you can say that having an advisory role without power is inconsistent with a elected House of Lords. Fifth point, the Office of National Statistics works with eight English regions plus London. These are administrative regions, a start, but not enough. What is required is the opposite of the abstract central state. The regions need to be given constitutional standing. And for this to happen, they have to become more than points of a compass. In other words, it's not the Southwest, the Northeast, the Northwest. The layers of human geography of the regions have to be rediscovered and espoused. <laughs> now, this is, could be quite an interesting pro process. You've got to give something to the regions that they want to. And um, you, you could argue that the central state, you saw that with Edward Heath's reorganization of local government, uh, has really effaced the old, old showers, the old shires, and the old traditions. And I think there's a number of things to be won back here, including decide, deciding what our regions, how, how one would name them. You know, the west of it, England should really be Wessex. We also have the problem of boundaries. South and east is a very big region and it just sweeps down the south coast, Sussex, Kent, and up to Oxfordshire. Well, that's a bit too big. Um, so all sorts of interesting questions to be explored there. Now, each region would send on a delegated basis so many members to the new chamber. The number of delegates from each region would relate to its population. Delegation ensures that regional issues become the focus of the upper house. Um, Andy Street, actually in the newspaper today, uh, when he complained about begging bowl culture from Mr. Gove, giving out little bonbons to the Cleethorpe Seafront or whatever it was. Um, he said, uh, the, the issue is not party, it's place. Point six, regional assemblies along the lines of the Welsh assembly would have an executive and a secretariat. Assemblies would be elected all 16 plus voters on the basis of an agreed version of PR, probably single transferable vote. Regions are big enough to encompass both the urban and the rural and to pursue strategic goals. They can only be made attractive to voters if they take from Whitehall real fiscal and expenditure powers and no longer have to seek approval for every scheme. 95% of all British taxation goes to the Treasury. In Germany, it's 65%. That was in the paper today as well. Their powers should be extensive, e.g. owning their own banks, raising their own bonds. Local savings go to local investment. Everything, be everything beneath the regional level, the regional tier, if you like, uh, and beneath them is the jigsaw of local government, stays the same, according to the principle of subsidiarity. Not that, not that local government ever stays the same. Mr. Osborne and Mr. Gove have been drawing a new administrative geography over the last decades. And if you think about it, that's ongoing, continuous constitutional change. And they've just created the uh, Northeast Combined Authority, 
which is not a metropolitan combined authority. It, it's it's um, the whole of Northumberland, uh, though missing out as my colleague on the Global Policy Institute, uh, Michael Lloyd points out, it misses out the su south part of Northumbria, if that was the region it would be called, because you've got Durham in the south. So it's creating the present situation with levelling up and everything associated with it. It's creating a constitutional sort of, I don't know, just a mosaic. Uh, it's creating to the sort of complicated jigsaw of local government. And it's creating sub-regions, whereas really you need something big enough, uh, which has the authority and the size to be something that counts in the in a elected upper house. Last point. Implementation would take time and require widespread consultation. Also, the question of the validity of any constitutional change cannot be avoided. What is the warrant? that guarantees change. Although this blueprint ties regional democracy to a repurposed upper house, these are separate operations and have to be interlinked. So in other words, one wants to start the ball rolling, but it's not gonna happen overnight. The starting point would be a manifesto commitment of an incoming government, as Sir Keir Starmer has already declared. This reminds us finally that the House of Commons is sovereign and can do anything it wills. But having a plan in the first place is to be recommended rather than muddling along. Thank you very much indeed. Um, very good and um, very nice complementarity between, between the two introductory speeches. Um, we're now going to get a comment, well, a number of comments on, on what um, Sam and Andrew have said from Councillor Simon Hennig. Thank you very much for joining us. He's the former leader of Durham County Council and chair of the Association of Labour Councillors. He was a prominent member of the Commission on the UK's Future, which was reported recently under the chairmanship of Gordon Brown. Um, Simon, once again, thank you for, for joining us. Um, uh, would you like to put what Andrew and, and um, uh, Sam have been talking about in the context of um, uh, of the commission and uh, how you see the two as interacting, where do they overlap? Where do they perhaps even contradict each other? You've got the floor, Simon. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Brandon. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to um, give a few thoughts this evening. Uh, and if you'll allow me, I would like to explain I think to start with the background to the proposals of the Commission on the Future of the UK, which I was a member, and that sort of background context. I don't think anything about the background context will be news to any to anyone uh, here, uh, but I think it's important to explain that context in terms of what we were asked to do. Um, Brendan, you've introduced me uh, very well. I was. Uh, previously leader of Durham County Council for 13 years, which uh, went unitary at the start of that time. I was the first chair of the Northeast Combined Authority as well in its first iteration, uh, bringing together an area of 2 million plus uh, people. Uh, and uh, clearly I have been a member of the commission uh, over the last couple of years. So the commission was requested by Keir Starmer in late 2020. As we've heard, it, it was chaired by Gordon Brown. It published its report uh, just last month uh, in December 2022. Uh, of course, we should note in terms of today's session, this is not a report specifically on the future of the House of Lords. There are 40 recommendations in all and 150 odd pages. Uh, so clearly covering a wide range of areas uh, and as I say, I'll just talk a little bit about the context and then move on to the proposals. To cut a long story short, in terms of what I've just been tasked to do, there's a lot of overlap here uh, with uh, the analysis that's just been presented, maybe one or two differences, which we'll also touch on. Uh, so the starting point for the report are the crises that Britain today faces, not least that our economy is not working. We've seen a decade of economic stagnation and we have a regionally unbalanced economy, indeed one of the most unbalanced of any major 
economy uh, and these regional inequalities are undermining the lives of millions across the UK. Uh, and the Commission's report cites a counterexample of Germany already mentioned, uh, where many parts of England are now no better off than the former East German lender, despite where they were after unification in 1990. And I still have memories of driving in that part of the world over pothole roads and all sorts of other issues and it's really quite extraordinary to see the uh, difference uh, over the last 30 years uh, and the stagnation in the UK over that uh, period. So we link this problem with over-centralisation and micromanagement uh, in Westminster and Whitehall uh, as we've already heard, uh, which dominates almost all decisions on spending and taxation, and particularly as regarding England, as we've seen recently, as regarding levelling up uh, allocations. Uh, indeed, it could be argued and has been that England is being run as the last remnant of the British Empire. Uh, there is an urgent need to put more control in hands of people across the country and fulfil the potential of all parts of the country. Now, at the same time as all of this, we have also seen a collapse of trust in UK central government. So it's not as if people are, uh, are, are, are very trusting of what they're seeing in terms of central government. Uh, people believe the government is simply not working on a wide range of issues. Our MPs and members of the House of Lords are seen as the least trusted elements of the political system. Politicians and government ministers are now trusted by only 12% of the British people, and trust in central government is among the lowest in the 40 OECD developed countries. Uh, and this is all cited in our report. This problem is getting worse over time, and nor is it one that's specific to particular parts of the UK, such as Scotland, because polling demonstrates that views are broadly comparable whether one resides in Scotland, Wales, or parts of England. And there is a, a consensus that Britain is headed in the wrong direction. So the Commission's belief is that our unbalanced economy, excessive level of centralisation and collapsing trust are intimately linked, uh, and that radical change in the way power is distributed is needed if we're to rebuild trust and rebalance our economy. And indeed, that's why the title of the Commission's report is renewing our democracy and rebuilding our economy because we were integrally linked. And indeed, that's why I believe some of the early criticism of the Commission's work that this is somehow a distraction from the current cost of living crisis is quite wrong. For unless we reform our political structures, we will not build the economy that we need for the future. To this end, three of the Commission's first set of five recommendations are a, a requirement that decisions be taken as close as possible to the people affected by them, a requirement that the autonomy of local government is respected by central government, and a requirement to rebalance the UK's economy. There are then subsequent sections on ensuring the right powers are in the right places in England, and then sections on Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and a fourth set of recommendations on our institutions of shared governments. Another group of recommendations start the process of cleaning up our politics, uh, and clearly uh, a sixth uh, will uh, also detail our proposals to replace the House of Lords. Now, as it happens, those proposals on the House of Lords re received much of the media coverage following the Commission's uh, launch, the launch of the report in December. Though I should point out, even within this session, that actually those recommendations only number three out of the total of 40. Uh, so with my apologies for that, uh, I will move on to talk about what we do say about the House of Lords. And as I say, I think there's quite an overlap here in terms of uh, analysis uh, and what we need to do about it. Clearly, there's much wrong with the House of Lords at present, not least that there are still 90 hereditary peers among its number, as well as 25 others appointed by ordination and many more by the patronage powers of the PM of the day. 
It's geographically unbalanced in favour of London and the South East. And it has an excessively large membership of almost 800, uh, obviously larger than the elected House of Commons and indeed twice as large or more as most second houses of parliament in comparable democratic nations. Uh, there is no justification for any of this uh, in the 21st century. Uh, and yet, although we've been discussing Lord's reform, as we've heard for well over a century, since 1910, we still find ourselves here discussing this. So in summary, our proposal also is to create a new second chamber of parliament, an assembly of nations and regions. Uh, this should complement the House of Commons with a new role of safeguarding the UK constitution. Uh, this does need to be a democratic chamber uh, with electoral legitimacy that will be closer to the British people uh, as it will be more representative of the nations and regions of the UK. We should also note that the Commission also proposes a Council of the UK and a Council of England to bring together different political institutions on a formal basis. So I just wanted to say that very quickly. Uh, as somebody who was a local government leader for many years, I believe that there is a, a, a real need for those sorts of institutions uh, bringing together uh, different bodies on a formal basis. Clearly, it doesn't happen at the moment, uh, even within the context of the devolved nations, but certainly not uh, in terms of local and central government, for example. So all of this helps tie together the different areas of the UK in a much more coherent fashion than at present. Uh, compared with the existing House of Lords, our view is the proposed Assembly of Regions and Nations should be markedly smaller than the current body. We've suggested perhaps 200 members, uh, and it should certainly be chosen on a different electoral cycle from the House of Commons. Uh, we have not specified a precise composition and method of election. Uh, and uh, see those as matters for further consideration, but it would seem sensible that one uh, proposal would be some sort of regional list system uh, uh, um, or equivalent uh, to uh, solidify the, the, uh, for, well, the, the function of the, the, the new body as a um, voice for regions and nations. Um, we accept in the Commission's report that some areas of work are performed well by the existing House of Lords, notably scrutiny of legislation and government policy, and, and we suggest that should continue as one of four broad functions, the others being to bring together voices of the different nations and regions of the UK at the centre of government, as we've very much heard from Andrew and Sam, uh, to monitor adherence to standards in public life, and to exercise new powers to safeguard the constitution of the UK and the distribution of power within it. Uh, and those functions should include overseeing the effective working of the new intergovernmental councils, which I've just described, as well as receiving reports on the other constitutional obligations which we propose. Uh, we envisage that the new second chamber would be responsible for approving the appointments of the new Integrity and Ethics Commission uh, as a replacement for the Prime Minister's Advisor on Standards uh, and for considering its reports, approving the Ministerial Code and where necessary action under it. Um, in terms of protecting the Constitution, we would build on the protection within the 1911 Parliament Act, which allows the Lords to reject a bill to extend the term of a Parliament and add to this an explicit power to reject legislation which relate to a narrow list of defined constitutional statutes, which uh, might, for example, include the Parliament Acts themselves, Constitutional Reform Act of 2005, which set up the Supreme Court, Representation of the People Acts, uh, and also, uh, it is suggested, the Sewell Convention, uh, which for the uninitiated, named after a, the then government minister who set it out in 1998 during the passage of the Scotland Bill, uh, that in his words, we would expect a convention to be established that Westminster would not normally legislate with regard to devolved matters in Scotland without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. Now, this has become quite a bone of contention. 
in terms of the devolved uh, nations uh, and uh, is uh, seen as something that, that could be on uh, this list uh, of uh, for constitutional protection. Uh, now, we've suggested in the report something that Sam uh, mentioned, which is the option of confirming the supremacy of the Commons in these cases by allowing it to overrule the Second Chamber, um, perhaps by two thirds majority or some other hurdle. Uh, we've also proposed that the new Second Chamber should not inherit present Lord's power of delaying all legislation emphasising um, that the second chamber is in general a revising chamber which cannot overrule commons. So that um, summarises what we have said. There is a lot of overlap, I have to say, in terms of um, uh, what Andrew and Sam have, have talked about and, and uh, have previously uh, published. Uh, that there is a difference which strays slightly away from the topic this evening, but we may wish to get into around uh, um, the regions. Uh, so we have, um, again, not specified uh, uh, structures within England. We say that everybody should be able to have the powers in the right places. Uh, clearly, uh, the last 10 years have established a number of mayors, elected mayors, mayoral combined authorities and so on across the country. Uh, and what we are not proposing uh, is uh, that um, uh, we should, as a starting point, go back to the regional structures that, of course, the then new Labour government established after 1997. Uh, now, that is is a difference from uh, what we've just heard. So as I say, we, we may want to talk about that, although it does stray, a course, away from the topic of the uh, House of Lords. Um, we freely admit, just the last point I'll, I'll make, Brendan, we freely admit that during the work of the Commission, we did not um, consult as much as we would have liked. Uh, it was a period clearly um, of coronavirus and all the restrictions that came with it. Uh, and we weren't able to do uh, what we would have liked uh, in that area. So this does give us now a opportunity uh, to do so. I think most people, myself included, would assume that we will see a general election probably in 2024 at some point, which gives us therefore some time uh, to uh, have the very sorts of discussions uh, that we're having in this session. I would very much encourage uh, such discussion, uh, very much thank the Federal Trust uh, for arranging this session uh, this evening and for the discussion at today's event. Well, thank you very much indeed. Very interesting, very, very informative, very helpful. Um, I think I'll go straight on to Francis and we'll give Sam and Andrew the the chance to comment later on things that Simon has said. Uh, Francis, thank you very much for joining us. You're the Deputy Director of Compass, and you were previously the Project Director on the campaign for a UK Constitutional Convention. You've written, written recently a Compass report on Germany and um, uh, its similarities and dissimilarities in governance structure to the United Kingdom. Um, the implication of what Sam and Andrew said is that um, the United Kingdom should look more like Germany in its governmental structures. Um, do you think that's a good idea? Do you think it's possible? Um, do you not think, let me say something a bit provocative, that the Germans are slightly less confident than they used to be, that theirs is a model which can be universally exported in terms of federalist governance? That's just my impression. Um, would you confirm or deny it? You've got have the floor, and thank you very much for joining us. Brilliant. Thank you, Brendan. And thanks very much for inviting me to speak tonight and to, to, to listen to the, to the other contributions has been really enlivening. So, yeah, and thank you very much for making space for this. I think it's, as Simon was just saying, a really, you know, opportune moment for us to be having this conversation, not least, you know, looking down the general election. But I think also some of what I'm going to say here tonight maybe relates a little bit to this, the question of sort of political will and political buy-in as well, because mm -hmm. I think, you know, I've been working in the democracy sector for a number of years now, and it does feel like, you know, just having the similar conversations in this cyclical way um, 
was really kind of refreshing to hear that you know the brown the brown report kind of opened up this whole space for people who've been thinking and talking about democratic change to kind of have a way in but of course sort of the real work begins now in terms of also what that process looks like and eventually how the political buy-in is created to make this as a sort of sustainable and lasting change but to pick up on your your question Brendan I think this this really relates to I'll, I'll say a little bit about Germany in a second but I wanted to kind of set the context for this in terms of really being clear to say as, as I do at the start of the report that Whilst I, I lived and worked in Germany for a few years and coming back to the UK, you know, you see your country through very, very different eyes. There is a different constitutional culture here in the UK, and that is undoubtedly true and shouldn't be underestimated in the context of what we're talking about and how we want these changes to happen. So for starters, obviously, the historical kind of context sets the scene for everything that we will talk about with the constitution. And what I often say when we start talking about constitution and democracy here in the UK is I... I think in comparison to a country like Germany, in fact, our sort of busy, biggest blessing has also been our curse in the UK in terms of stability of governance. So, you know, you could say that we had our kind of democratic moment, our democratic revolution far too early, <laughs> took other countries kind of a time to catch up with that. And I think since then you've seen, you know, arguably one of the most stable systems, systems of government in the world. And a lot of people would say that stability kind of depends on this kind of incremental approach of kind of muddling through, as I think Sam put it earlier, and constitutional reformers like the people on the call tonight have had to face that, you know, look at that culture and not necessarily expect that we're going to get a big constitutional moment like they did in Germany after the Second World War, which is, of course, is a big moment for a reset. And, of course, we would hope that some, not something sort of disastrous as a crisis is needed before the UK looks at things constitutionally. But I, I am sometimes a bit of a pessimist about this just because it's very difficult to, to kind of import another country's cult, like constitutional culture onto our own. So I'll just say that as, as, a, as a caveat. Um, but of course, I don't want to cover any of the things that have already been said tonight. I wholeheartedly agree with basically everything that has been said in terms of the necessity and, and in fact, urgency of this question. And I was really heartened to hear the linkages being made between the kind of economic and political turmoil that we're just seeing day to day now. And, you know, in confidence, we do a lot of meetings here with, with MPs here at Compass, and we were speaking to a couple of MPs this morning who were saying what we're seeing is major institutional collapse across different institutions. You know, whether you look at the health system or if you look at, you know, uh, just the whole public sector being on strike. I mean, I think we really shouldn't underestimate these, these moments. And I really do think that this is this is a question for us of, of of renewal and of repair. But if you know the Labour Party in particular can sort of have the courage to take this as a key moment of thinking of a of a restructure of a reset, which th thinks you know to use Keir Starmer's own language, not sticking past the politics, but really looking at the underlying structure. And I think this is what we're here talking about tonight. So I wouldn't underestimate the importance of this. But of course, then as Simon said. People come back and say, OK, given all of this going on, how do we get to people talk about things which, you know, can appear quite dry or quite arcane? And I think, you know, my response to that is often that the house, something like House of Lords reform is the tip, should be the tip of the spear in that sense. You know, not wanting to evoke too many violent metaphors of revolution. But I do think that there's this real question that um, at the moment, I think what you're seeing in terms of democratic malaise across the country is also that people have stopped believing that kind of progressive constructive, positive change is sort of possible. I think we, we shouldn't underestimate the disaffection that we're seeing amongst the citizenry at the moment, you know, polls suggesting that trust in politics is, is a very, very low ebb. And I think something like the opening up this conversation around the upper house could be a real moment for the UK. So I do think I, I want to, you know, focus a lot about this question, how, how this happens. We've talked a lot about the what, and we've also spoken, obviously, about the why. But I think to pick up Simon's point about the process of this, um, you know, it was very exciting to me to read the Brown Report and, it, and, you know, some of the language in that and some of the kind of vision of it was really, was, was really refreshing to see and a really welcome at a time when also, you know, Labour Party hasn't been pushed into this. I think Keir Starmer has spent some political capital in, in getting this done. I'm just really keen to see how he picks up on the other side of it. But I think what was really sort of lacking for, from it for me was this question about process, because if you're talking about democracy and constitution, you, it has to be democracy all the way all the way down, really. You know, and I think 
more than consultation, what you want, and obviously I would say this having worked on the project around a constitutional convention, is to use this moment for a kind of national discourse and a national conversation about where we're at. Now this, I think, will push against some difficult trends for the Labour Party and other political parties, which is how do you start a process but not control it? And I think for that, we can look to amazing examples of obviously Ireland is, is, a, is you know, a cast, a cast iron example for those of us who are interested in citizen assemblies and deliberative democracy. You know, not a perfect process by any means, but a process by which citizens, randomly selected citizens were involved in a national kind of reset, you know, where they went through different parts of the constitution. And some huge moments came out of that, obviously around equal marriage and abortion legislation, but other things as well around climate, around the place of gender and, civic society. And I think that is the sort of scale of which I think we need to address this issue is that sort of imagination and this national discourse, which where you have school children and, you know, civil society groups kind of feeding in. And I think that could be a, a really powerful idea. And in fact, I spent a year with this project designing a process so that doesn't feel too overwhelming. And there's a handbook available for anybody who wants to take that up. So then just finally, I, I think the, the report I wrote recently was, as you say, Brendan, really focused on Germany. And I'm very, I'm very aware that sometimes, you know, it can feel a bit of, a bit annoying to always point to other countries and saying we could just, you know, hook, line, sinker, take this thing. And, you know, isn't it great that they do it over there? And, you know, the grass always seems greener. But I think in very specific and precise ways of where the UK is right now, the German, the German model uh, and the German examples are really kind of illuminating for what we could have if we were to radically decentralize. And my report kind of mentions four key things, and I won't go into, into a lot of detail because we've already discussed it here tonight, but um, the first one being regional renewal, which is, is, is sort of inarguable how necessary that is. And it is interesting to me that we haven't really mentioned the term leveling up here. I'm not sure if that's intentional. Um, and certainly the government has seemed to have stepped away from what was a kind of calling card of their 2019. Uh, I don't think we ever talked much about levelling up. <laughs> well, exactly, <laughs> we anticipated yeah. the government's change of tack. Well, precisely. And I think that's what was interesting with, you know, without trying to be overbranded about this, some of what we were trying to say to progressive parties on this one was, you know, t take the other side of the stick on this and talk about powering up, talk about, you know, where power lies and where decisions are made. And I think this question about regional real can only really be unlocked with that, without those, without that devolution of power, without subsidiarity we heard here tonight, it is simply not possible for any sort of long-term economic recovery or development to happen because, as Simon was saying, you know, the carpet gets pulled out from you from one government to the next and the pendulum swims back and there's, there's no possibility for longer-term infrastructure or progress to be made. Um, just a couple of the points then that, you know, the other three points that my report kind of picks up are maybe things that haven't been discussed here so much tonight. And they relate to sort of maybe less uh, tangible, less structural and more sort of cultural and political changes that you might see. The second one being kind of challenging the preconceptions about which parts of the country are important. And um, as someone who grew up in Pennines in the north of England, um, it, you know, it struck me that when I went to live in Germany as a child, that actually the, the cultural rebalancing of, of, of the country could be incredibly enlivening and empowering for parts of the country which feel kind of overlooked, that feel like they don't matter, that they don't have a big part in the national story, or if they did, it's all about what's lost. You know, it's all about our northern industrial past. You know, we, we learn about the industrial revolution at school and then the rest of the story is like power being ceded to London. And certainly, you know, lots of areas are feeling that very acutely and I think we mentioned Brexit, but, you know, it's one of the most class correlated votes in recent UK history and also one of the most regional um, correlated votes in terms of when you look at regions that have been underserved and I would say actively disempowered over time, you know, they tend to have voted against the status quo. Two final other things to mention. One is that I think we've touched on it tonight, but the idea of local leadership, the importance of leaders being grown at the grassroots and actually coming up through those structures it's really, really important in Germany. And you'll see some of the, the, you know, all leaders have to start sort of with a local foot in the local camp. And you talk about, you know, some of the things that we get at Compass when we talk about proportional representation here is that all the MPs say, oh, but I want to keep the constituency link. And we say, well, actually, there's many ways in which you can keep the constituency link. But what you should also do if you can care about that constituency link, which I do think is important, 
is kind of revitalize local government such that local leaders are not seen as lesser than MPs. And I think in Germany, you have more of a parity of status of esteem simply because they're understood to be genuine local leaders who can speak very powerfully and with a lot of integrity about the local area. And finally, you know, I, this is maybe a more political point than we, we really discuss here tonight, but in, in terms of selling this idea to specifically the Labour Party, actually, I've been saying, you know, it, this really does, as much as we might talk, you know, very powerfully and with a lot of integrity about the importance of democracy and kind of addressing this alienation and disaffection, which is at the heart of all of this. But it's also about winning elections. And I wanted to say, you know, I want to say to the Labour Party, this is this is popular. This is, you know, actually specifically the House of Lords is super popular. We, you know, we look at polling on this and sometimes much to our chagrin, PI doesn't, you know, it's just gone over 50 percent of people in the UK for one of the first times since I think the 1980s. That people are supporting a shift to PR. But actually, House of Lords is the thing that people <laughs> really gets people going. I mean, there's basically across, you know, if you look at also different demographics, there's a basically across the board, young and old people of different socioeconomic backgrounds all agree that the House of Lords is a travesty. It's, some people see, use the words disgrace. I've certainly heard that from that from focus groups. And I just think this sort of thing is powerful. It does win elections. And to Simon's point earlier about you know, how you make this sort of relevant and, and link it back to the political state of where we are now, I think you know, there's some, that's something to make political leaders sit up and listen is it helps you win votes. So that's my uh, that's my final point on which to end. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Very very lively and uh, and in, informative. Um, what I'm going to do is ask Sam and Andrew briefly to comment on, on the things that um, they've heard since, um, and and perhaps particularly to talk about a, a question that struck me as I was listening. Um, uh, Simon said that, that there, there is a difference of emphasis on the question of regionalism between the the, um, the commission report and what Andrew and Sam uh, are talking about. Um, that difference of emphasis seemed to me to to reflect something that is important and central to the German federal model, namely that that there are alternative forms of democratic legitimacy in Germany. To the House of Commons, I mean, one one of the things that that always strikes me as as de almost defining the present British political system, not necessarily to its advantage, is this, uh, I would say, obsession, but um, um, important role, central role of uh, sovereignty of House of Commons, which is often defined as um, a zero sum game. If the House of Commons is sovereign, nobody else can be. Um, do do you think that the that the the call for regionalism uh, is in the mind of some commentators unattractive because it seems to to undermine this uh, tradition of the um, uh, of the sovereignty of the House of Commons? Andrew, would you would you like to comment yeah, on sure. that and comment um, on other things that have been said? Um, yeah, well, I'd just like to introduce. Some work, something which I did just a little while ago, um, sort of halfway asking that sort of a question, which was the attitudes of uh, the peers in the House of Lords and the MPs to changing status in the um, House of Lords, in particular, the, the degree of, of uh, democratization, if you like, or popular voting for it. Um, and it was kind of interesting because. Uh, from 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 recollection, uh, a fairly solid chunk of the peers were not interested in having anything to do with any elections at all. They quite liked the existing arrangement that they had. Uh, there were some uh, MPs actually who uh, were also uh, not too unhappy with the idea of having no, no sort of democracy effectively in the House of Lords. But generally, there were more people um, in the House of Commons who were getting more interested in the idea of having more degrees of uh, democracy in, in the House of Lords until it came to, would you like the House of Lords to be 100% uh, elected? At which point, I think I'm right in saying, it was something like a majority of the people who were polled said, no, they didn't want that at all. And can, in the House can, of Lords- can, so, can I butt in here? Sorry? The, I just checked this, the, sorry, Andrew. Um, the, House of Lords runs a tracker 
and 6% of the people approve of an unelected House of Lords. Mm. And it gets up between 40 and 50% mm. for an elected House and goes up towards 60 if it's elected and appointed. So yeah. that's, yeah. I looked that up yesterday, so that's the kind of... <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, Carry on, uh, but, Andrew. But, sorry, but the, the, the point is also that I think uh, in the House of Commons, there's no uh, great... I think, but uh, bedrock of opinion, which is looking for a fully elected uh, House of Commons, because House of Lords, pose, House of Lords, you mean? So, sorry, House of Lords, yeah, um, because that would pose a threat, if you like, to the reserve powers and the, and the matters that you were just talking about. And I, my my conclusion from this at the moment is to say is to look at it this way and say, I don't think in the current uh, two Houses of Parliament that we have there is actually any serious majority for change, as far as I can see, not at the moment. And if that were to be the case, and I don't know what Francis and Compass would think of here, would that not sort of, in a sense, reinforce the view, which is that if there is going to have to, if there is going to be some changes, then uh, it would have to be done by some sort of constitutional convention outside of the House of Commons. And I think one would have to have an arrangement where the House of Commons, if they were prepared to go that far, agrees to have a constitutional convention and to accept any uh, solutions or, or decisions which they make. Because at the moment, I don't see within the House of Commons, or let alone within the House of Lords, a sufficient body of opinion that is really so strongly motivated to make those kind of reforms. Sam, do you want to comment? Well, taking up Francis's point about the German constitution, uh, Max Weber in no November, December 1918, wrote a blueprint for the German future form of state in five days. They locked him in an office at the Frankfurter Zeitung and he came out with a 20,000 word blueprint. <laughs> and it underlies the point that actually it's a bit, it's a, Brilliant analysis, and it's so dense, it, it's never been translated before uh, until I finally did it in an issue of, we'll plug here, of Max Weber Studies. Incidentally, this issue of Max Weber Studies, which is the latest one, is a special issue on what we call the Neo Weberian state. When there's a whole bureaucratic aspect of this reorganization of democracy. It's not just democracy, um, it's self-administration. Um, it's taking, you know, people want to be able to govern themselves. I mean, it's not, it's not pure 100% democracy. And in fact, Max Weber in his, in his blueprint, he had this wonderful phrase so, saying, democracy is only as good as its institutions. And so if you have a different institutional complexion regionally, and we already see this in Wales and in Scotland, you know, these are different forms of democratic cultures. So I think I would agree with you, Brendan, when you, when you put that point forwards. And this domination of the media, I mean, you have a centralised media and everything turns on what Mr. So-and-so uh, uh, Miss, 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 Mr. Largebridge, to use a trollopism, uh, says from the back benches of the Conservative Party. I mean, if you had a House of Lords that was generally a regional forum, you would introduce a much wider bandwidth of what's going on, as well as where the people are themselves. Um, I've already said that the House of Lords only 6% approval as it stands. Uh, another point which I thought Francis made, which needs definitely, and it relates to the convention point, it needs political leadership. Now, the level of political leadership in this country, I don't think is terribly good. And one of the reasons for that, I mean, obviously that's very judgment. Um, one of the reasons for this is that not many good people are going into parliament. They go into the city of London, they become investment bankers, and the House of Commons is, is their next career move. On Rutherfield is on the downslope. <laughs> and it's not like <laughs> and it's not like to go back to Trollope, where you know the, the the highest club you could belong to 
in the 19th century under Mr. Gresham, um, Mr. Gladstone was the House of Commons. Yeah, best um, club in London, best club in London. Simon, did well, you no, want to... No. Oh, sorry, 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 Sam. The, it's uh, they came through the House of Lords, the, the regions. I mean, that's the whole point about Trollope, is that the House of Lords reflected uh, the regional interests, aristocratic, obviously, and landed. But if you democratise that, then you get a different sort of flavour that you get in, say, you know, large local councils. You know, it's a bit difficult to the, recreate I'll just, create that, to have the Earl of Derby owning most of Derbyshire, and that was his regional interest. Representation. Simon, is there something you'd like to comment on? Particularly, would you like to comment on this question of, of whether uh, an obsession with the sovereignty of the House of Commons um, uh, is, is a, a major barrier to, to constitutional change in this country? Uh uh, well, clearly it is deep rooted uh, in terms of the um, uh, that sort of belief. Um, I think, nevertheless, it's important, and it was very interesting on the work of the commission that it was accepted in the discussions that we had that there has to be reform of the centre because it always seems to me that one of the features in Britain politically, whether whoever it is in governments, is that governments love tinkering with things lo you know, in, in local governments or regionally that leave themselves untouched. Uh, so I do think it's significant that, uh, that the Commission has looked in detail at, at reform of the centre uh, and, and we've talked about the uh, proposals in terms of a, a replacement for the House of Lords. So, so and, uh, you know, so, so that I think is a, is a very welcome, um, that is a very welcome step. Um, I just one point I think was touched on there actually um, that I always think is a part of this is we all talk about the centralisation of sort of political decision making or of our economy, uh, but actually there is a, a real centralisation of the media in this country as well, which makes things very very difficult. That there's a set of assumptions held by the media uh, and. Um, you know, I can give you specific examples of that when I was leader of Durham County Council and was asked things like, well, well, how can you make that decision when one of your members of parliament thinks the opposite? Uh, and, you know, the fact that a member of parliament might not actually have control over or, or you know, any sort of uh, remit over something like licensing policy, for example, or planning or many other things didn't seem to enter into the heads uh, of the person that I was that, that was asking that question. Um, so I, I, I personally think the centralisation of the media is an issue, and I'm not quite sure how you deal with that, uh, but but it sort of solidifies the centralisation that we've talked about, uh, and it, it makes it very, very difficult um, in terms of uh, moving this, uh, this, this debate forward. But as I said, I do think it's significant that the Commission did spend such a long time talking about reform of the centre. I do think that's a, a major step forward when sort of one of the, uh, a body of work obviously going to one of the major political parties uh, did do that uh, and, and has accepted that, you know, that's where we need to spend some, some time uh, and a, an incoming Labour government needs to make those changes where it's not going to be successful. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, Francis, would you like to comment on on, um, on anything you've heard? Yeah, um, I'll just pick up a couple of points. I, I think one was this 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 last question about, you know, how you use the opportunity to kind of uh, renew questions about media and cultural influence. And I think that's that's why I'm interested in sort of what the political class see as being the issue here, because I think if if it's taken seriously that this is a sort of structural change and in fact big structural change then you know will precipitate changes in other spaces i think it is that bit of chicken and egg and i and i do think that this is why i kind of wrote the report about germany really is because you know it's uh, without wanting to fall into the trap of kind of british exceptionalism where we say we're also like 
uniquely terrible about this sort of thing. I do think sometimes when we th think about the state of our democracy and structures and, and questions about sort of media and centralization of media, we don't actually look elsewhere as much as we should. And um, I think pointing to, to Germany where, where because power is vested at the local level, it makes local journalism far more appealing and interesting because you can actually hold politicians to account who have substantial power. And in fact, are often doing really interesting and innovative things. I think there's, there's a question about storytelling here. Like if there's just not as much things happening at the local level, both in terms of the power and, and, and decision-making, and also in terms of kind of cultural aspects, you know, civic society life. I think th those things are deeply intertwined, but I think when we talk about structural change, we need to talk about these other things as well. So people can sign of see and feel it and smell it and know that that's what it would be like. So what I mean when I say these things is when you, when you go and, you know, when you spend time in a country that has this federal structure, you really notice that they are seen as multi layers on a kind of, a national democracy framework. Whereas I think here in the UK, it can be hard to kind of unpick ourselves from that kind of mentality that actually it's this whirlpool. London is this whirlpool and other things kind of have to in orbit in and out of it in order to be taken seriously. So I think on that on that point about, you know, what do we do about the media? Well, we do the structural change and then the other stuff I think follows after it where money and power is, so too will media be. And that will be a shift. As everybody has said, it will take time. But I think it would be incredibly exciting. And um, it's a bit like Lisa and Andy always says, you know, it's it's trying to trying to take make any sort of progress in this country when large parts of the UK are being held back and not able to contribute to the kind of national development, whether it's economic, whether it's cultural. You know, you've seen all of this uh, Barney at the moment about <laughs> the the you know opera moving to Manchester and do people actually want to go and visit opera in Manchester that sort of conversation would just be completely anathema it seems to me in Germany where basically every small town has its own opera house it seems like to me you know there's this there's this deep interplay between the cultural side of things and the political side of things and I think the more that people like us who really care about constitutional reform and the like minutiae of the kind of structural changes can link that to cultural uh, and kind of economic opportunities the more that we will have a a bigger audience. And just finally, this question about sort of political will, I think, you know, the way that I've looked at it is yes, okay, Compass did come out and say we'd, we'd, we want that kind of Brown uh, report to be sort of broader and deeper, deeper, not least on the sort of procedural point of how do we practice what we preach and involve people in this sort of conversation. But actually having said all that, you know, I, I think uh, in order to make this come up the agenda, we've seen, you know, even with 97 and even with the modernizing impulse of 97 and the work that, you know, Blair and Brown did, and from all accounts, you know, I think they did it in good faith to try to modernize the, the constitutional setup of the UK. If Starmer were to take the series at all, he's going to have some serious, like, backlash from all sorts of sources that we've heard here tonight, not least from the Lords themselves and people who have a direct you know, stake in it and people who see it as their sort of pension plan, it, we shouldn't underestimate the extent to which we will get political and, you know, it could get quite nasty. And so what I do say is that despite the fact that we always want to say yes and to the Brown Report and we kind of want to make our additions and we want to have our perfect approach, I would say the real important thing is to build the political capital for this and to to give Starmer all the backing he needs to kind of take this seriously and say, this is a really, really important thing on which almost all of the other parts of your political settlement rest. If you don't do anything about democracy, how do you expect to make progress on climate or social inequality or the NHS and public service? So that's kind of my message to them. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm having difficulty, I'm afraid, uh, allowing people to speak from the audience. Can I ask people who have a question, I, Mr. Roper, I think, has a question, um, to put it on the chat function, and then I'll have to put it to the to to our to our um, speakers. Um, but I, I'd really like to take up while we're waiting for the for these comments. Um, Fran the last point of Francis uh, about um, about um, uh, the political process whereby this change comes about. Um, she mentioned um, Keir Starmer. Uh, it, it's got to come from Starmer as well. Um, uh, it, it's not just a question of, uh, it seems to me, um, of, of saying, well, let's get Keir Starmer elected and then he'll do these things which may be suboptimal, but at least our progress. Um, uh, isn't there an onus on him 
um, to, to play a more uh, active role in these things um, in order to, to form opinion and to, to begin a, a real process of, um, of constitutional change. I'm, I'm not yet convinced that, that, that he is committed to that. Perhaps, perhaps I could ask you about that, Simon, and then come back to, to, to Francis Ata. Um, do you think there is a commitment in, in the present Labour leadership to constitutional change? Uh, well, I don't think Keir Starmer would have asked for the commission to be set up to start with, had that no. not uh, been the case. So at I the think time. at the time, at the time, well, it was quite early on. He was, if you remember, he was mm. elected as Labour Party leader in what April, I think, twenty twenty. So it was within the first twelve months of being elected as mm. as a leader. Now, I think that's that's you know that that's probably quite quick if we compare that to to say the. Blair period and so on, where I don't think these issues really did feature much in the in that sort of first period when sort of new labor was being formed. So so I do think it reflects a, a clear commitment. And certainly everything that we've heard uh on the commission at the launch, for example, when Keir Starmer was again present, as by the way, were several other uh front bench uh members of the um uh the Parliamentary Labour Party. Uh uh, we certainly are very confident that there's a very clear commitment to uh, move things forward. Uh, having said which, you know, we, I mentioned before, we certainly, um, you know, suggest that there's definitely still uh, room for more consultation, more discussion. Uh, we're the first to put our hands up and say that uh, some of our, our ideas that we've come out with um, you know, may need development, uh, you know, that may need more sort of skin on the bones, if you like, uh, moving moving forward. But we've never had the impression that that commitment isn't there. We certainly believe that that commitment is there. Uh, and we very much uh, expect to uh, see that when it does come to the manifesto in the next election, which, as I said before, I, I would very much expect to see next uh, next year. So I, you know, I I totally get that there's often political scepticism and so on around, um, you know, the, the way these processes happen. Um, but uh, you know, all the signs to us are are, are positive. Um, uh, so you know, we're we're certainly very optimistic about how this moves forward. And then, and I I think I may have hinted at this before, just also to say this really is the key period, a year, a year and a half before an election. And it strikes me that's a key period for any government being elected, because once governments are in power, they, they often just don't have the time uh, to sort of uh, really look at uh, these issues. Sorry, I'm going to have to just turn off uh, my video feed very briefly because uh, I've got a, an issue there. Um, but we can hear you. It's, and yeah, it's, it's, it's really important that this we take the time now to, to put in our views, to have these discussions, as Francis just said, uh, and not leave it until after an election, uh, because governments then get very preoccupied by whatever they're dealing with uh, at that particular time. So, uh, you know, this is the time now when we absolutely need to be having these uh, discussions uh, as we're having this evening. Thank you. I'll get Andrew and Sam to comment and then come back to Francis, if I may. Uh, Andrew. Um, yeah, just thinking a bit about, about the, the Labour, Labour Party position, I mean, it struck me that there's such a great reluctance in senior leadership of the Labour Party to take any sort of political risks, um, that something like this just appears too radioactive and therefore would not necessarily want to be uh, sort of uh, carried around in public all that often. On the other hand, I also get the feeling that uh, there's a, there is pressure from within the Labour Party to become more radical, to have some more sort of interesting and con possibly controversial policies. And I got the feeling that the commission was in some senses perhaps a vehicle or a receptacle for putting all kinds of relatively unspecified and not necessarily well-formed ideas, but throwing them into this particular pot and saying, well, if we get elected, uh, then we can start to unpack all of this again. Uh, but I tend to agree. I think that these things need to be discussed before rather than after. And I think it also reminds me of the situation in 1997 uh, with Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. 
I mean, they went for devolution in Scotland, as I recall, uh, largely because they thought it would defend the position of Labour MPs in Scotland, because the Scottish uh, population would be so thankful that they would go on voting Labour. And if you remember in those days, Labour had quite a significant majority in Scotland. Look what happened. Labour was completely wiped out politically in Scotland. And so I could also understand, I wouldn't agree with it, mind you, but I could understand why, why the, the leadership of the Labour Party might well point to that and say, oh my God, you're not telling us that we've got to do something like that again, are we? <laughs> we can't afford to lose the North, we can't afford to lose the South, or whatever it might be. Sam? The, I think there would have to be some sort of constitutional convention um, Max Weber was a bad example in 1980 and didn't exactly work out. Um, the, after the Second World War, the Americans put a lot of effort in thinking through a federal democracy. And of course, Germany went down because Prussia was abolished in 1932. Um, in a sense, it was an attack on federal democracy by the conservatives. That's sort of a historical aside. Um, I think a lot can be learned from comparative studies. Reg, Mus Reg Meg Russell wrote a very good book on reforming the House of Lords, and she did it back in 2000. And if you look at Spain, you can see the mistake the Spanish made. They created a Senate, but they didn't link it to the regions, which are obviously more important in Spain. And they ended up with uh, just a hodgepodge, and the reform sort of didn't really work. Um, Australia is another good example, um, and in terms of allocation of funding, Australia is very interesting, and the Welsh Assembly Institute of Welsh Affairs has done quite a good report on that. So I think it is going to be a learning process, but as Francis says, um, it'd be very nice if uh, the culture of the regions uh, could also make their contribution. So it's going to have to be um, a traveling road show, I think. Francis, and then we'll, we'll bring some people in from the audience. Anything you want to say there? Yeah, just really briefly pick on Sam's last point. So we spent a year, um, a small group of organizations who received money from this so was a year funded project to look at how you would design a constitutional convention. Um, and we did try and like cover all bases in terms of thinking about the kind of the, the process of like the, the things that you would need to cover and how you would actually make the process feel as democratic as possible, involve as many people as possible. And also we were obviously looking at other countries who'd done this in a sort of more dynamic, lively and inclusive way. So obviously looking to the examples of Ireland where we talked to a lot of people who'd been involved in the Irish constitutional um, conventions of, of various kinds and the citizen assemblies that have been set up. And thinking, you know, as much as it was possible about the kind of media side of that, about the cultural side of that, about bringing in kind of artists and poets and people kind of to enliven the process. Um, and that was kind of that was fascinating because it showed you how much the kind of the the, the sort of onus of whether that was going to work or not lay very much in the hands of the designers of the process such that actually, you know, uh, to get that political buy-in, um, it's not just right and just that you should have that democratic feed-in, but actually to get the kind of cultural buy-in that you need from a broad, like a large, dem you know, demographic of people in the UK, you really need to people bought into this idea that this is like a key moment, a key constitutional moment. And then there was this age-old question of whether you could manufacture a key constitutional moment when they didn't feel like a, you know, a war or a resetting of the boundaries or whatever. And as I said earlier, you wouldn't want to wait for that sort of crisis to happen. But most of the examples are taken from those places. Obviously, you look at South Africa and its constitutional moment. And that was a, you know, hugely also kind of a moment of bittersweetness in terms of there was a lot of trauma to be worked through there and similar yeah. to Germany after the war. So I think it, it's about tying those things together and, and that to be always part of the conversation to someone like Keir Starmer to say, how do you say this is a new start? Well, you do it, you say it by doing things differently and doing this sort of process in a really open and imaginative way, it really signals to the rest of the public and to the, to the country that you're willing to take this seriously and involve as many people as possible. Thank you very much. Um, 
I mentioned I was having difficulty allowing people to speak. I'm going to ask Ulrika Rube, who's been managing the the event, um, to allow Mr. Roper to speak and uh, and put his his question. So if we can just wait a moment for him. Uh, I see his name has come up on the screen. Andrew. We don't seem to be getting an answer yet. Um, Ulrika, please carry on trying to raise Andrew Roper, but I'll um, go back to, to, to a further question that I was going to put, um, which would really to, to ask the unfair question of, of Simon. Um, what do you think is going to be in the manifesto? What do you think are the, the realistic bounds of what might be in the manifesto? The Labour manifesto I'm talking about, and perhaps in that context, you should you could con comment on on whether the conversation you're talking about is one that's within the Labour Party, or, or or is there a chance over the next couple of years of a, of a broader conversation in which um non Labour Party individuals and commentators might participate? Um. Yeah. I mean. As I said, I think when I uh, was sort of finishing my comments before, we uh, have certainly suggested when we published the commission that there should be a further period of consultation. Uh, we've actually suggested as part of the report that an option might be a series of citizens assemblies uh, in different parts of the country. Uh, and, uh, you know, th this is a period that, that needs to be used to build up this conversation. Uh, and uh, you know that that's very much in in tune with the with the thinking of the commission. Um, I certainly think uh, that this will feature in the uh, Labour manifesto. Uh, clearly, uh, there's a process uh, in which all political parties go through ahead of the you know production of the manifesto, and 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 Labour has a process as part of that uh, involving its sort of structures. National Policy Forum, National Executive Committee, and so on. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I very much uh, expect uh, there to be things uh, around that we've talked about uh, here. We've already heard uh, Lisa Mandy, uh, who's been mentioned, uh, and I think Keir Starmer talk about uh, a, a sort of take back control bill, I think she's termed it, uh, uh, um, you know, moving forward, and I think building on some of these ideas. So I think the conversation is developing and that's what hopefully will take place over the next uh, year or so. Uh, you know, we've got the time to do that. And I think that's what that's what needs to uh, uh, happen uh, at this, uh, you know, uh, at this time. As I said before, I think there is clear commitment uh, from the um, leadership of the Labour Party uh, to carry on talking about these things. Uh, and, you know, had there not been, the, the commission wouldn't have, uh, you know, wouldn't have taken place. Uh, so I, so I, 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 I am very optimistic. What I can't, um, you know, do clearly is predict exactly what that's going to look like uh, when that sort of, uh, you know, comes out of the other side and we move towards the election uh, in terms of the manifesto and so on, because, you know, we're, we're probably a good year away. Uh, from that process, and we have to go through several processes in the interim. Yeah, you 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 don't think it, you think it's premature yeah. even to to set out some sort of likely parameters uh, of where you think the party might come down. It's an unfair question. If you don't want to answer, then I can well, quite I understand. Out, I think we're getting the outlines at the moment, and uh, you know that the, the speech is being made, whether by Keir. Lisa and Andy and so on, I think, are, are, are giving that outline, what tends to happen in these um, you know, periods is that that's then gradually filled in in terms of the detail. Uh, and I think this will be no different uh, uh, over the uh, over this next period, which is, a very, as I mentioned before, I believe is a very important one because uh, governments simply have so little time and actually even less time they th than they think they're going to have. Uh, after they get elected. So it's a very, very important period in terms of this next 12 to 18 months. Uh, and I very much hope that the sorts of things I've I've talked about there, uh, you know, that we do see that uh, over this next period. Yeah, good. Um, 
Sam, Francis, and Andrew, I think I, I'm going to ask you to make final remarks, all of you, uh, and then we'll give the last word to to um, to Simon, um, who obviously has, is hot from the battlefront, as it were, um, of, of, the, of the commission. Um, perhaps Francis would, would like to start with her concluding remarks. Yes, thank you. Uh... Brennan, I was actually going to pick up some a couple of the questions in yeah, the Q and A, um, which was really this question about. Um, I was interested in this question from Will about how you encourage, uh, how you tackle the kind of unhelpful competition rivalry so that exists between local authorities, and I think that is a really fascinating question, which we didn't sort of get into tonight, but I think is also something that needs to be discussed also in light of you know not looking to Germany as also the promised land there is obviously lots of questions about this payments and I cover it in my report in terms of about equalization payments are, are highly fraught and very sort of contentious um, in Germany and, but I think my starting point for this goes back to actually what, what Andy Burnham often says about these things which is that Actually, at the moment, you're getting more tension and conflict because there's a complete lack of clarity <laughs> about who gets what and why. So this quest, you know, it goes back to that once again, just hammering the message that you need a coherent approach to changing our system, such that you can have a coherent system to start with. You know, you know, anybody who's ever worked in politics and campaigning knows that what is just, you know, it's it's hard enough making political change happen. What is even harder is when you don't understand how power works within the system and it's not transparent and accessible to people and in fact tends to be quite arbitrarily exercised. So, you know, without getting into the constitutional settlement too much about this, the problem about our uncodified constitution and about the constitutional culture that I alluded to earlier here is that because things are quite incremental, they allow for a lot of arbitrariness and not least when it comes to decentralization. So I think my final plea would be, you know, uh, that you know, let, let you let, let let the Labour Party show not tell a kind of different way of approaching this by starting with this sense of, OK, we're going to get a grip on this. We're going to kind of push away what we used to do in the past in terms of like incremental change, which is obviously just often just responds to crises and ends up being quite reactionary. We're going to try and do what yeah, actually the incoming Labour government in 97 did say that it wanted to do, which was modernise, which is look at the systems in the round, which was really kind of get a grip on things. And even go a step further than that, because I think what you know New Labour could have done, as I keep saying um, forever, is is really make a kind of national moment out of that and bring people into this approach. So that's what I would say in order to respond to his question is let coherence be, you know, both the thing that you're aiming towards and also the thing that defines the process by which we get there. So democracy kind of all the way down. Yeah, very good. Sam. Yeah, I'm just looking at the Q and A's. Um, this idea of um, there's a problem. I mean, if you if you go to say Dorsetshire, which is a unitary authority, Dorset is just Dorset. Uh, they took powers away from Bridport, I think, and uh, Bridport was complaining that everything's gone to Dorchester. You know, these these tensions are always there. In my proposal. Um, or rather um, under the present setup with mayoral elections. So the any Northeast, you've got one elected mayor controlling a whole region. Whereas what I'm saying is you elect a regional chamber, wouldn't be very big, but it would be there on PR. And therefore no, nobody is left out. You can't say it's based on Newcastle or Teesside or, or what, whatever. Um, so that's that's the way I would get round there. And the other thing is to increase the offer for regions. You've got to make it attractive. Um, and what you're saying is, look, Whitehall isn't working. You need to think of any of the great departments of state and tell me what which one is working well. As Francis said, we're we're facing institutional collapse. Okay, there's going to be a transition problem. But what you're saying is that actually, you know, real forms of bureaucracy are going to be moved down to you. And there are other countries, would you believe in the world, you know, <laughs> constitutional democracies that have done this. Singapore's done it. They have a whole of government approach. Uh, Japan is, is, is reforming its, its local and national government. These things are considered in great detail. So, you know, Political, political science and political administration has a lot to offer here. On the Scotland question, 
if the, the it, as a nationalist project, uh, uh, one question says, well, you know, what's Scotland? Why should it agree? Well, I, I agree with that. If you're a nationalist party, uh, you don't want to be a, any part of, of Westminster. But consider this. There are 56 SNPs in the House of Commons and they're very vocal and they're all very interesting in the things they have to say. But like the whole of English constitutional government, British constitutional government, uh, you have an opposition sitting there and all they can do is, you know, be rhetorical. Now, if you consider Scotland in terms of self-determination, which doesn't have to be sort of Woodrow Wilson autonomy of nations. The issue is, is more subtle with self-determination. If you're given actual powers to sit in a council or to sit in an elected upper chamber of the devolved nations, um, then that's an offer for, for the Scottish voters. Andrew. Bonnie. <laughs> Well, I've just written two words down here, uh, crisis and transformation. Uh, I, mean, I think we've heard from all of the panelists, really, uh, examples where the situation and the system is not working at all well. Um, and, you know, this somehow needs to sort of catch fire a bit more than perhaps it already is in as much as yes you have uh, strikes going on uh, in the public sector workers at the moment you've got a cost of living crisis and all the rest of it all of which takes uh, a lot of media attention but at the end of the day one of the ways of trying to resolve this it seems to me is to adopt some process of constitutional change as others have, as today have already pointed out hence the notion of transformation and the transformational power this could bring with it and i think that that's some those are sort of some positive messages uh, as to why one should be trying to do something along these lines um, and, to dem and give people sort of an upside. Because my goodness me, if you look at the, the numbers uh, on terms of regional development and all the rest of it, it really is a pretty gloomy situation. And it goes back much further than just the last couple of years with the, these crises. Uh, the differences between the regions has been getting steadily greater. And the, on, the only area really that's done particularly well over the last sort of 20 odd years has actually been, or well, certainly the last 10 years, has been London, as we know. And London is sort of gradually encroaching and gobbling up everything else. So uh, these are urgent questions, it seems to me. And yes, one needs to take it all very carefully. One does need, I think, something along the lines of a convention, a constitutional convention and all the rest of it. And yes, one has to be very, very careful about how one goes about it. But there is a sort of fuse, I think, uh, fizzing away, uh, uh, some, something underneath uh, ready to blow us all up. Unless this is taken, given a high priority and people start to move uh, on it more quickly. There was a question that had been put, um, anyone can answer, but Andrew, since I'm talking to you, um, are regional identities more difficult to establish in the United Kingdom than they might have been in Germany or Austria or other continental countries? Um, the Northwest, for instance, is yeah. very much a case in point. What is the Northwest? Is it Manchester or is it Liverpool? Well, we've, 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 Sam and I have spent quite a lot of time talking talking about this, and I was also looking in some detail at the structure of the uh, the lender in Germany, and most most of the lender have many industrial centres or city urban conurbations within them. Okay, uh, so there isn't this sort of urban rural split so much. Uh, not mind you, one of the some of the smaller uh, lenders they don't have very many, obviously, because they are pretty small. Um, but about the, the question of forming regional identity, I, I, in what we were kicking, the idea we were kicking around a bit earlier was, was it's, and I think uh, Francis was saying something about it as well. It's got to to encompass, if you like, more than the policy. It's got to have some regional. It's got to have some cultural identity. I think, um, and to that extent, I, I suppose one would concede perhaps that in Germany it was it's, it has been easier to achieve that. Um, I don't. I believe it's still possible to do this in 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 England. This is largely an English problem, isn't it? Because the 
devolved nations have already, in a sense, gone down that road that much further, and they've managed to find some national identity which they can rally around. Um, I think the, the task is for the, the regions in, the, in England to, if this, this change was to be uh, to, to be to successful, to start to think about uh, aspects which, in a sense, bind them together in a regional sense. Um, Simon, if you can conclude, and perhaps I can make one remark. Um, when I was questioning um, about the commitment, um, if you like, of, uh, of uh, a future Labour Party to constitutional change, it wasn't so much meant as a reflection on the Labour Party or the particular people who are in charge of it at the moment. It's more that, that I worry, as Francis, I think, has been hinting, is that, that there might be a systematic bias against change within the British political system. And that, that that's the problem, that, that it, it, the system finds it very difficult to, to reform itself. Um, can you comment a little bit on that, whether that's a danger that you see, that um, as we get nearer to the election, all the parties will say, well, it's just too difficult, it's just too complicated, um, let's concentrate on other things. Um, can you provide me or others in the audience with, with, with reassurance on that beyond what you've already very powerfully said? Um, well, yeah, really, to reiterate what I said before, my view is that once people are elected, that's when it gets particularly difficult. So therefore, I believe there still is, you know, a real opportunity in the in the run up, as I've, I've said before. And that's why I'm still confident, uh, very confident in terms of what's been said by the uh, leadership of the Labour Party taking this forward. Um, undoubtedly, history tells us that once uh, governments are elected, uh, they've been, uh, you know, they've got their group of members of parliament in the House of Commons. The governments have formed. It can be then quite difficult uh, to, uh, you know, maybe make uh, some of these changes. But I think this is why this next period is so important. Um, uh, that, that uh, you know, that, that we're now in that, that certainly I would expect to be a year, 18 months or so in the run up to that election. So. You know, I am optimistic, um, but I don't you know, particularly once you're in power. We saw this actually with, if, if you'll allow me slightly to digress, we saw it with regional governments under the last Labour government, when initially there was going to be a pattern of regional government for all regions. Then it was um, sort of reduced down to those regions that wanted it. Then suddenly it was three regions and then it was one, the North East. And then we know what happened in the referendum. Uh, which uh, sort of kicked it into touch and the whole process, uh, really. So, uh, you know, th this is, I think, um, a danger certainly once uh, when you are in power in, in, in government uh, and you find that you can't deal with, um, for example, uh, you know, designing that, that you know, the reform right across the whole of England at the same time. So you have to just concentrate on, on a small chunk of that. Um, um, just, just if I may, if, if, if can I say that I think there are really interesting questions that have been posed by the members of the audience in the chat. I think all of them uh, are very interesting and would probably keep us here for many hours uh, in terms of the uh, the uh, discussion and so on. Um, just in terms of the um, regional uh, uh, sort of sub regional, if you like, um, uh, sort of rivalry uh, that you can have and. Obviously, I've got some experience of having been a council leader and also chaired a region, uh, a, a, um, a combined authority. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to throw in was that I think some of the better um, combined authority areas are, are already dealing with that by effectively bedding in almost a cabinet system of leaders of different councils. Uh, so you see this in Greater Manchester and some of the other areas. So I think there are ways, again, of using institutions uh, at a local or sub-regional level to try to bed in that cooperation and get people working together. Uh, and I think that's uh, uh, an example of the sorts of thing, again, going back to the commission that we've tried to propose in terms of not just the House of Lords being replaced by uh, the um, 
you know, the, the body that we talked about, but also the councils that, that we've talked about as well to embed this cooperation that is really lacking at the moment uh, throughout the uh, throughout the British system. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, one of the things which I, I remember talking about in on the commission, for example, which I still vividly remember was when there was a row between the first uh, leader of Scotland and the mayor of Greater Manchester, I think it was about COVID restrictions, uh, as, I, as I recall, uh, and just thinking, well, actually, uh, in many countries, that would be taking place in a body uh, like the upper chamber, uh, rather than on the media, uh, you know, and on our TV screens. Uh, uh, and, and so it's, it seems to me that there's a very interesting discussion about whether we you know, key figures like the, those I've just mentioned, for example, actually should be in the upper chamber themselves, uh, representing their bodies and tying together the UK in, in a much uh, um, sort of more coherent way than at the moment. So, so maybe that, maybe that's a, a, another discussion, but it, but I think it's an example of that that we, you know, that that we do need more uh, uh, sort of discussion, uh, conversation on these issues. Uh, and that we do have uh, time to do it. I think in you know, my closing thoughts, I, I believe this is a real opportunity. It is a constitutional moment. This is important. It's not a distraction. It's vitally important to the uh, success or otherwise of, a, of an incoming government. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I will continue to, to make those points to my little bit uh, to make sure that these are key issues that are, are taken forward. Uh, uh, at the general election, but I have every confidence that they that they will be. Well, thank you very much indeed. Very positive um, note on which to finish. Um, I'd like to thank in particular our two outside speakers, Francis and, and Simon. Um, thank you very much for your your knowledgeable and stimulating contributions. We're, we're greatly in your debt. Um, Sam and Andrew, thank you for going through um, uh, the, the the ideas that you've already put on our website and which um, are continuing to evolve. Um, I know you'll be publishing more material in, in the coming months, and I'm sure many uh, of the audience and many followers of the Federal Trust will greatly benefit from, from the discussion as, uh, as you carry it forward. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we'll obviously be in touch as the Federal Trust with, with more events as the year unfolds. Um, and um, I hope you found it as interesting and informative as I have. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.